is when children naturally start to uh, inquire about how our world works and why we do things the way we do them. And so we're going to uh, utilize that in making those connections and really answering some of those questions and, and furthering their knowledge, teaching them how to find those answers. And then the rhetoric stage is to put the first two stages together so that um, students learn how to speak and write eloquently and persuasively. Almost Academy will have mixed age classrooms. There are quite a few benefits. I've listed just a couple of them. Um, our preschool classroom, we are gonna have preschool. Um, the three-year-old preschool will be in the morning. Four and five-year-olds will be in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. Uh, our grammar school classrooms will break into lower and upper grammar. Lower grammar is our K through two. Upper grammar is three through five. Um, a lot of the benefits for mixed classrooms are younger students look up to the older students and really want to emulate their behavior. Oh, so-and-so knows how to do this. I want to, I want to do that too. Um, but, the, but there's a benefit to the older children as well because once they can uh, teach younger uh, classmates uh, an idea, it kind of solidifies it in their mind. It's the last stage of learning. So, uh, and there's, there's much more data on these mixed classrooms. The biggest challenge is just classroom management for the teachers because uh, they're gonna teach this material and then assign according to ability to the students. So it's a little bit more on their, their side and that is the one challenge to it. Our logic classroom is uh, sixth through eighth grade and our rhetoric classroom is nine through 12. One of our biggest questions that we've had since our first parent meeting is about our school building. Uh, we originally thought that we would have to set up more of a pod system where instead of having one building for all of our students just for financial reasons, we were going to set up a pod and lease buildings uh, at different locations for the different classrooms. We are actually talking uh, with a couple of different locations right now to lease a building that will house the entire school. So all of our students can be in one building which is better for parents. It's a little bit easier logistically. Um, but once we, since we're still in those negotiations, we will just keep you informed as we make those decisions. We are gonna have a dress code. Um, this is applic applicable to everybody but preschool. Pre we all know that dressing preschoolers up really, really, really probably isn't that ideal. So. Um, we're gonna keep it pretty simple though. Uh, solid color dress pants, sports, dress shorts, Bermuda shorts. Uh, we're not gonna stipulate a specific color just so long as they are solid color. And short or long sleeve collared shirts uh, with no print except for Almost Academy logos. Um, Fridays at Almost Academy in the afternoons are fun days. We will invite the community in. We will have um, people come in to give presentations to the entire school. Uh, we'll have field trips, we'll, we will have uh, lots, of, lots of real life experience for the students, and so they will have uh, Fridays free from dress code. Uh, we will go through some do's and don'ts in the handbook and, and get down to more what is acceptable. We're, we still obviously can't have certain attire. Enrollment options for Almas, uh, full-time enrollment is a eight o'clock to three o'clock day. Uh, depending on whether you're in grammar, logic, or rhetoric, uh, the full day includes language arts, literature, Latin, math, science, history or geography, art and music, uh, PE, mm. nutrition, and enrichment and logic. The hybrid enrollment is uh, unique to Quincy. So the hybrid enrollment, we will have actually two options for that. So we'll have an eight to 11 and a 12 to three and you can pick which, which sections you want. So the, the classical hybrid model would be the language arts, literature, Latin, science, and history and geography. Um, but you can also choose to do uh, the second part of the day, the math, art, music, PE, nutrition, enrichment, logic, um, kind of depending. We'll go through the schedule in just a minute so you guys can kind of see what that looks like. Um, this would be good for uh, people that, whose children want to play sports, so you can split your day. You can go to QHS. Uh, I think you have to take five. Where did Michelle go? Five. You have, five. To take, you have to enroll in five classes and the sport, and the sport's the sixth one. So in the rhetoric program, your classical hybrid would be in the afternoon. So you would go from QHS at, uh, from 7.30 to noon, and then noon to 3 at Ole Miss. Obviously, we're going to have to make a little bit of leeway there for travel time. Um, 
But there's also homeschool families and homeschool co-ops in Quincy that need more support. And so we're trying to offer that option for them as well. Maybe they like their program at home for literature, science, and history. They need a little bit more support in the other things that require more of a, of a student body. And we still do have an a la carte option for families, uh, homeschool families that just are looking for that one subject that they need help, help with. Tuition. So our preschool will run Monday through Friday, half day. Uh, preschool is 2,000 a year, 200 a month. Our K through eight is 3,300 per student per year or 330 a month. Nine through 12 is 4,500. Uh, that does include all of your book fees. That's, that's, that's the whole shebang. You're not gonna be charged any more than that. There's a 10% discount for payment in full by August 15th. Uh, but of course, payment plans are available. We understand that you know everybody is on a budget. So um, hybrid enrollment is, has a $1,200 discount off of the uh, full tuition pricing and individual classes are 1,000. We do offer multi-child discounts. So if you have three students enrolled in Ole Miss, there's an $800 discount. So you can apply um, for four students, $1,200 discount, five students, $1,600, and it goes up $400 from there. Here's our preschool, preschool schedule. So preschool is for three, four, and five-year-olds. As I mentioned, uh, the eight to, eight to 11 morning preschool is for three-year-olds, and the 12 to three is the afternoon four and five-year-olds. Monday through Friday. K through eight schedule. So this is grammar and logic school. It's an eight to three day. Uh, we've already gone through all the subjects that will be for the full day. So these are the breakdown of the hybrid. So at eight to 11 will be your classical morning, language, arts, science, and history. And your 12 to three is the educational assistance hybrid, which will be math, guided reading, and humanities. And PD, I forgot to put that on there. Uh, rhetoric schedule is also an eight to three uh, before the hybrid. We're actually flip-flopping that from, uh, from the uh, K through eight. So the morning will be the educational assistance hybrid with our math, art, music, P, nutrition, enrichment. And the 12 to three will be the classical literature, science, and history. Um, at our next parent meeting, this is the stuff that we are working on right now, so it's coming soon, will be the enrollment application. You'll be able to apply both in paper and online on our uh, website. We will also have the student handbook complete at that point. And we are also going to ask parents and students to sign a statement of accountability. And that just looks like proper behavior, proper care of the facilities, proper respect to teachers and classmates, um, that sort of thing. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention is that we have uh, decided to not allow cell phones in the school during the day. So they may bring them on campus, they have to turn them off and put them in their book bags for the remainder of the day and then they can get them back out at the end of the school day. So we just feel like the cell phones are a distraction to most students and it's more helpful for them to just put that away, focus on learning and whatever phone calls uh, need to be taken if there's an emergency situation, Clearly, parents and guardians can call the office and the student will be excused to come down and talk. Okay. So from there, I am proud to introduce uh, two of our teachers for Almost Academy. Uh, and they're gonna actually go through some curriculum for you guys and walk you through how this day really looks. We also have some sample curriculum over there, which you guys are welcome. We encourage you to look through. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katherine Zanger and Connie Heverlein. Hello. So uh, my name is Katherine Sanger. I am the um, grammar director. So that would be your elementary school, the K through five. And I'm Connie Heberlein. I am the logic director, six through eight. So um, since this method is a little bit new for this community, we wanted to go and just do a brief overview of well, when we say classical, what does that actually mean for your student in that classroom? Like what, what curriculum does that entail and how do you teach that? So we, um, we first and foremost tell people that classical education is history based, meaning the entire school is connected because we are all doing the history timeline um, from kindergarten all the way up through high school. So this year we actually are starting with the Renaissance and we're going up to modern times. 
so what that means for a kindergartner and what that means to a high schooler is completely different but at least for the teaching aspect and for parents we all know what branch we're all working on um, and the way we teach that is through language it's very language arts based so lots of reading lots of language arts based things um, in the classroom language focused we also go through the history timeline and cycle so we break up the timeline of human history into chunks so cycle cycle one would be u.s history um, a full year of u.s history cycle two would be ancient history to medieval and then what was the other one cycle three is um, renaissance to reformation and then modern modern history would be another year so through those four cycles Another thing that's very um, different and interesting for classical models is you're not going to see a ton of textbooks used. We use a lot of literature-based education and a lot of um, what they're called living books. So you could, your child could have a science book for that year, but it actually reads out like a storybook. And so we use the storybook of that science lesson and build in um, with other textbook and non fiction type text into that storybook. So that's another thing that I find very interesting about the classical model is the use of those type of narrative living books more so than, um, than the textbooks. So I'll talk quickly about, um, so for the grammar stage, the elementary stage, the K through five, some of the curriculum that we'll be using is um, these will look familiar to you if your student is already in like the public school setting, but that would be the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment system. Those are gonna be like if your student is already in a graded level, so A through Z um, guided reading levels is what a lot of families are already familiar with. We will be using that same methodology for reading and phonics. Um, we're also going to um, tie in not exclusively but we are going to use other reading systems like the Abeka reading program some families are used to we're going to marry that in um, like I said those uh, living books I'm excited about the sassafras twin science about it's about two twins who go and live with their uncle who is a scientist and that's how they learn about science so that's how our kids will also be learning about sciences with the sassafras twins and the adventures they go on with their uncle um, in math for grammar school, we are going to use the Singapore Math and Focus. And um, we've been asked before about our standards. So for the grammar school, our standards will still be based on the national standards because for um, reading and math, those concepts are all what we still want to hold on to through K through five at Almas. Um, we're also going to add in just a few of our classical standards from our model to kind of round that out back to the classical model. So I've not ever taught classical education before, so I'm, but I'm super excited. I've been an educator for 13 years in the classroom, but I'm, this makes so much sense, the way we teach our kids using history as a spine and weaving everything together so it all makes sense. It makes sense for the classrooms to be intermixed um, so that the younger are helping the older. It makes sense for families to be on the same page from kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade and even up through 12th. So we're gonna be using um, the excellence in writing lessons, weaving that history in there, Saxon math, and um, the elemental science, Sassafras Twins Living Books, those will match up also with our historical periods, and the well-trained mind story of the world for our history spine. And then you can see too how like, with me being from the grammar stage, the elementary, and then how they work up to Connie, it all matches. So your student, you can, as a parent, you can understand what each student is doing, even though they're in different grades or different ability groups. And then um, another big 
plus for classical is the cohesion, the interconnection of every subject that weaves in and out of each other, and the cohesion as a school. So in my grammar stage, I always give the explanation that M is for mouse. We can also say it's for Mozart. So there's never a subject that is too complex to at least start to introduce in the grammar stage. So we always describe it as, I, in the grammar stage as the grammar teacher, I am going to build that box. And then as the student gets older, um, they are gonna go to the logic stage in middle school and Connie and that team are gonna put things into that box. But I am going to introduce those concepts so they at least have the first hand memory peg of what they're talking about. So they're not just, not just jumping into middle school and they have no background of classical music or um, different historical literature pieces. So we're at least gonna give them the first steps. And uh, of course we don't expect them to fully understand everything that comes with Mozart, but we're at least going to um, let them dip their toes a little bit into that subject. So I love the idea of Mozart and then logic um, in the logic phase, then they're going to start putting in um, information about the classical period and different music that he composed. And then in high school, in the rhetoric phase, uh, I even had, I saw a student once, a uh, high school student wrote a argumentative paper about how John Williams is the best composer and how Mozart is the worst. So, so that's how they, we build those boxes and that's how those students are going to use those boxes as they grow. And then and as a teacher, it's so wonderful because I'm gonna set the boxes up, but the grammar school is gonna know what boxes I'm building. So they know how to build their curriculum and what to put in those boxes. And then so I get the question, well, how do you know what boxes to create for those children? So in classical education, we use the term or the banner, truth, beauty, and goodness. So, the boxes I'm going to create are the concepts, the history, and the people that have contributed to the great conversation of human history. So it's the concepts and people that have built on either truth, beauty, and goodness. Um, down here, I just have pictures. Uh, my family is Greek from my dad's side, so I always start with like, you would think of the Greek philosophers would be in that box. Those are boxes we would like to set up. Um, Shakespeare, Da Vinci, and then even all the way up to scientists and the science revolution and discoveries. So we have those in there also. So it's like, what are the main points in human history that we need these students to at least start getting those memory page boxes set up for? Um, and another thing too that Connie and I had a very good talk about this morning is we don't necessarily as teachers, we don't necessarily need to take a contributor and agree with what they did. We don't need to agree with their philosophy or their methodology. We just need to say they did make a contribution, no matter how I feel about it. And then as they get to the rhetoric stage, like I just gave the example with the high school students making argumentative papers, like they then are able to at least have that background knowledge to then form their own opinion. Like maybe they don't think the enlightenment thinkers were the greatest, you know, they start building those opinions, but at least they have an idea of what they're talking about. I'm gonna um, shoot it back over to Jennifer, so thank you. Does anybody quickly have any questions for Catherine or Connie? You guys wanna come back up and take questions? Do you want to do Q and A at the end? <clears throat> I'm gonna let them answer or ask okay. questions while it's fresh. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I understand if you're building boxes, what if yes. the student starts after what at the junior high point where you're not you haven't built the box, so she starts building. Yes, we've talked about that because a lot of people are coming into this model without the foundational of the grammar. So we're still going to, in an age appropriate way, still work on that memory work, even though they didn't get it down here. And then we've talked also about at least starting off in our first couple years, our middle school and rhetoric, we're not going to completely hound those classical 
bullet points because we know they don't have that background. That was, that was kind of my question too. When, I, when they come in, I, I would have a son come in at eighth grade and hasn't had, you know, the, the build up of what you're talking about. Like how are you, how are you going to fill that gap? You know, so that was my question. How are you going to bring them up to speed? Yeah. We'll be working really closely together to make sure that kids get those gaps filled in. Yeah. So, and another thing we had talked about was um, with our reading list, like of course there's those reading lists that are beautiful and good classical literature, but maybe since those kids don't have that background, we're not reading the original text yet, like a, like a classical school would be. We'd be using like a bridge, a bridge versions, or maybe we're finding another text that has those themes, but they're not as heavy. So we're definitely, we've already definitely been talking about how to build that um, curriculum to where it's still classically founded, but a little bit lighter. We've also talked about using, uh, not that classical, I mean, it's more language based, but we've also talked about uh, using the school to just put some of this stuff up as like a visual reminder mm -hmm. so that even the older kids that maybe don't have the background can still constantly be looking at it and kind of reminding what they have learned and, and continuing to grow that way without it being, you know, you don't know this. Okay, we don't want to be like that either, right? We want to, we want the school to be cohesive. So if we can just use that um, and how we, what we put around the school, we can kind of catch them up that way too. Another really good thing that we're going to implement also, because this is also a new model for parents. So um, yes, we're going to have parent, parent teacher conferences like every school does. We're also going to offer the pre semester um, planning with us to where they can come see everything we're working on for that semester, ask questions, then they'll, they'll understand what's happening instead of after the fact, trying to catch up to their student. Um, you had a question over yeah, here. Question. Yes. So you mentioned that you're going to tell stories to each math and science. This yeah. idea is a new for me. Yes. That, does that mean we're not going to, that student, the kids are not going to have like hands on in math and science yes. courses? Yes. So math is second? still, math is still a, what you would consider a typical math class. Okay. It's just the other subjects that we try to tie in as much literature into that. And I actually have the science program here also, so you can take a look at that. But it's, um, we start them off with the story, but then we start folding in the textbook and the, the informational pieces to that story. It's just a way to engage their interest, and then we use nonfiction to fill in what we want as far as like the facts of that subject, okay. if that makes sense. You mentioned it's traditional, and I am pretty sure you don't mean that you're not gonna use technology are you going to use technology in classes like iPads or computers? I'll answer that. I was going to say, we will have a computer lab, but no, we will not be using iPads or computers in the classroom, especially for our grammar and logic students. So there may be room for that in the, in the high school, but we will not be using it in grammar and logic. There's a lot of data that um, kids actually connect when they have a live person in front of them that's engaged and they have the textbook. So there, there's just a lot of good data on that for the younger kids. Um, that's still a conversation worth having for the rhetoric program. Um, and we certainly will have a computer lab. We're not gonna let people go out into the world and not know anything about technology. But I think we can all say as parents, our children know a lot about technology already, right? So um, the last thing I wanted you to mention is um, one, of, one of the big questions we, we are asked so we are more of a philosophical classical school, so we are theologically or religiously neutral. So we're not gonna be teaching any doctrine. We will be looking at that time period in history and exploring across the world what these different cultures are doing. You know, how, how they behaved, how they governed, how they worshiped, we're gonna be looking at all of that. So, but we won't be teaching a specific doctrine. It's gonna be presented to our students as theory. This is the theory, this is what was happening here. This is why they. This is what they did. Why do you think that is? When you get into the logic and rhetoric portion, so I want to touch on that too. Absolutely, and that's what I like. She said, having the timeline as our spine, we can take that timeline and give the kids a much more completed worldview because they know exactly what is happening in every single continent. And um, 
classical education kind of started dwindling from popularity in mid 19th century. But now as modern educators, we're getting kind of more excited about that because we can fill in those gaps of what was happening around the world that maybe original classical education was very um, Western civilization based. Of course, we're still gonna acknowledge the importance of that in classical education, but now we get to plug in the African kingdoms and all the other different things that were happening in that worldview. Can probably this is more in your rhetoric level. I <clears throat> find this a lack of education today. Is there gonna be more emphasis on civics? Yes. I mean, most of you are going to our that's actually, our, our that's actually a high school graduation requirement. So we will be uh, meeting all the high school gradu graduation requirements uh, per the state of Illinois. And then, like we've mentioned, add in some of that classical. But yes, yeah, so they will take American government actually twice. So once in logic school, once in rhetoric, and then there'll also be a civics class as one of their electives that they, that they take. Mm -hmm. Actually, something else unique that Almost Academy is going to do uh, as part of the civics, uh, so another semester is called community involvement. So our junior and senior students, uh, our 11th and 12th grade students, pick a charity of their choice and they actually intern on their boards. So they learn about Robert's rules of order and bylaws and how you follow them, how you communicate, how you're respectful, wait your turn. Because if we're gonna create these critical thinkers, we also wanna give them the tools to give back to their communities. Any other questions? Jennifer. We're going to move in, um, onto, a, onto our partners or into our partnership. So uh, you are your child's original and irreplaceable teacher as their parent. You are, you are so important to their success and you're important to our success too. We want the individual families to join the Almas family. And so what does that look like? Families work together. They uh, have fun together. They, uh, they build together. So it takes all of us. So we are going to ask each family to give 20 hours of their time and talents to almost throughout the year. And uh, as I just mentioned about the community involvement, we're also asking our rhetoric students, our high school students, to give 10 hours of community service to the community. So it cannot be done at Olmos. Um, that's for their family hours, but we want them to give back to their community. So 10 hours throughout the year. And so families, what does that look like? What gifts, talents, and time would you like to give to Almost Academy? There are uh, several different uh, volunteer uh, committees that we've set up, and there's a, a sheet on your seat that kind of goes, goes through those. Um, I, wanna, I wanna take the chance to really dive into what each one of those looks like, and so you can decide if that's where you fit in. So uh, fundraisers. Uh, we, we are not taking any government money and we are not tied to a church. So the uh, school will be funded by tuition, fundraisers, and benefactors. So fundraisers is a big one there and we're all gonna have to work together to have annual fundraisers to bring this money in. And uh, you know, we've thrown around lots of ideas on how that looks um, and how to get the community involved without always asking them for money. So maybe it's just something fun uh, they can provide a place, uh, they, can, they can come out and do something fun with the fundraiser, but uh, we all know people that love to play in that kind of stuff. If that's you, join the team. Um, community and events outreach, uh, that volunteer committee looks like uh, helping plan and bring in um, people for our Friday fun days. So scheduling the hospital to bring the ambulance over so the kids can look at it, scheduling a lawyer to come and do a mock trial on our Friday fun day or uh, scheduling a doctor to come in and show the kids some of the tools that he or she uses um, can look like a plumber coming in and talking about how they do their job or an electrician or a contractor uh, it can look like a lot of wonderful things also field trips so this committee would be in charge of uh, coming up with field trip ideas um, so it'll be a pretty fun committee. Also for our rhetoric program, we will host a dance for our uh, high school students. So that committee would help uh, orchestrate that dance too. Uh, maintenance um, with the buildings, what we're trying to get these deals with, uh, you know, we don't have a big repair and maintenance budget. So we're gonna rely on volunteers to do minor things. So if there's 
small projects that teachers need uh, built for some reason and you have a gift and talent that way, you can, that would be part of the maintenance committee. If there's a wall that needs to be painted or uh, something that needs to be fixed that's minor, that would be that maintenance committee that would step up to do that kind of stuff. Supply and lesson planning looks like uh, parent volunteers that want to come into the classroom to help, help the teachers prepare for the lesson, cut papers, take over the, a workshop uh, table, that kind of thing. So if you, if you were more interested in being involved in the classroom, that would be more for you. And administration would be uh, volunteering to answer phones or take notes or um, all sorts. I'm, I'm just drawing, drawing a blank right now on uh, making copies. That would be a good, uh, good one for the teachers, making copies. Uh, just things of that sort where you'd rather be maybe not one-on-one -on -one with the students but in the in the school building. There are a couple of requirements that we are going to have for the, certainly our teachers and our staff will have this. We are going to be taking some sort of uh, protecting children, uh, you know, and how to identify sexual abuse and things of that nature. So our, our teachers and our staff will be required to do that as, long, as well as a background check. Um, but our parents, we, would, we do ask you if you're going to be in the uh, school with the students that you also take that. Uh, that's very important that we all know the signs and, and the ways that we can protect our kids. Um, do you have any questions? Yes? Uh, I had a friend of mine that couldn't make it here today. He had a question that would fit right in line with what you were discussing here. Um, he said, uh, wanted me to ask what the vetting process is for the potential educators to ensure they don't deviate from course curriculum and the facility's mission statement and what course of action would be taken if brought to their attention. So uh, I'm really glad you asked that. So uh, right off the bat we will not have a headmaster so uh, most most of that sort of stuff will be handled by the board. Uh, so if there's ever a question about, I don't know if this is in line with our mission, this is not classical, we're veering off, that teacher would come before the board and that would be a discussion to make sure that that curriculum or that curricula, that lesson plan is in line with our mission. So the board will be handling that certainly for the first couple of years. Once we find a permanent headmaster, that may be something that we hand over to him or her to handle to make sure that it's in line with the mission. Um, but excellent question because we have to make sure that we stay in line with that. Also. Uh, Michelle and I, as co-founders of Almas, will never sit on the board. We will be, we will sit as founder and co-founder, co-founders together, and so we will always have Almas's uh, mission in mind to make sure that it stays uh, on track. So, hope that kind of does that answer the question. Oh, and then the vetting process, like the vetting background, process. Background okay. Check, there will be so, a committee yeah. to help the board. Yep. Yeah. There is a committee set up for that vetting process to run the background checks and make sure they are educated in uh, the program that I just talked about, you know, how to how to identify um, children that are being abused and, and that kind of stuff. I know that some of the different churches and uh, charities and organizations, nonprofit organizations have different ones that they use. We'll find one that fits with, with us and that will be a requirement for our staff. Yes? Because you know your child better than anyone and you being involved in that process and becoming part of the almost family is so incredibly important to us we do think that is kind of a missing element right now and we want to restore that to parents when you really see your child blossoming in that moment in that school where you're helping build build you know something for their classroom you know that that kind of working together brings brings the whole community together and it's it's it makes just for a success story you know, you're getting to see firsthand what's happening with your child. And that, what that does is when you get home, now you know what they're learning. Now you can really help them. You can really engage with them. And I love the, the history model for that reason, because it really starts that conversation with the families, but then they can come back to almost and, and give back. It teaches you that it's not always about you, right? It's about the bigger picture. So it's, it's a good selfless exercise that we can all give and then set for our children. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Better than I know that. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Um, so I don't really want to like start this topic, I guess, but it's a question that I have. Um, right now, I'm starting to deal with um, like quarantine testing again, where they're doing like mushroom quarantines in the center that my two kids go to. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the things I was going to ask, just like, you know, as kids are exposed to just everything in life, are we going to be like canceling school for multiple days, like full-size classrooms, or will we kind of handle it in like a one-off, one-case basis based on just, you know, using reasoning and keeping kids home when they're sick and not exposing them to... That's how we're going to handle it. We will not be quarantining whole classrooms. Um, as of right now, there's no masking requirements, and truly we have tons of data coming out talking about how harmful it was to our students. So, barring an absolute catastrophe, we will not be requiring that either. Um, as far as children being sick, I think it kind of goes back to if your child doesn't feel good, let them stay home. We'll catch them up. You can work with the teachers to get them caught back up. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we won't take extra cleanliness, you know, mitigations during the winter, you know, cold and flu months. I, that's just common sense, you know. We can use our science class in grammar school to really teach these kids how to wash their hands. Uh, it's amazing to me how many people don't know how to do that. So, you know, we can we can go over that. But yeah, I, I, we call it common sense measures, but it's just, you know, if you don't feel good, stay home. Um, if you've been around somebody, I mean, you can give them the courtesy of calling and saying, hey, so-and-so has the flu, but beyond that, no. We're gonna try and return to as much of a normal uh, school day for these kiddos. They need this. Our kids are, the mental health across the United States right now is super sad. Amen. Thank you. Nothing important, so I could stand around building. For sure. Any other questions? Yes? We actually do. Okay, so um, I didn't get to go into that. And since we do have a lot of new people in here, I do want to go over that. So in, we won't have a teacher uh, per first grade, second grade, third grade, since we've already gone over the fact that we have mixed classrooms. So we will have a director over each program with teacher's aides that help him or her teach the lesson. Um, right now, that teacher to student ratio is like 1 to 15 with a teacher's aide. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really good ratio. Plus, if we, if we have our parents come in and volunteer as well, we even have more time for that one-on-one -on -one with the students. Uh, yes? Do you have plans for like uh, extracurricular activities or youth sports? And if, if you don't, would that maybe be a committee idea for later down the road? It certainly is. We, that is one of our challenges right now is starting, uh, certainly sports programs are very, very expensive. Uh, so that is an awesome committee idea. Um, we'd love to create that down the road. Now, uh, uh, starting right off the bat, we will have two extracurricular activities for our students, and that's journalism and drama club. Nice. So, yes? I see the mission where you're trying to get family, parents, teachers, students all together. Mm -hmm. And it's where your commitment goes, which I really commend you. Um, this is probably a future for the board inside. I guess you can kind of get this constructed. While you have a parent, Okay, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, so we have talked, we have interviewed at this point well over 100 people from all walks of life and all different expertise. And one of the things that we are hearing is that parents are either so busy, so stressed, or just simply don't know sometimes like, and how can I be the best for my student? And so, uh, as part of our uh, 20 hours that we're asking, the 20 hour commitment that we're asking from families, uh, two of those hours, we would request that you come to a parent uh, mixer, like meet and greet, for two reasons. Transportation is also a challenge of ours, because we won't have transportation the first, especially, certainly of the year. And so that gives you an opportunity to meet other parents and say, hey, um, I can get them to school, can you help me get them picked up? Right? So kind of the carpooling. The other thing is, is we are inviting counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists to come in and give us tips and tricks as parents to say, how am I the best version of myself so that I'm setting my student up for success? What does my child need to make sure that when they go to school, they can be, they can spend that time learning. How do I hold them accountable at home? How do I hold myself accountable at home so that everyone is set up for success? Does that answer your question? 
Yes. We are actually talking about doing a school year from Labor Day to Memorial Day. So it will start a little later than uh, QPS and uh, I, know, I know sometimes they get out that third week of May. We will actually really go to the end of May. Um, we haven't really kind of hammered out the break schedule. We were talking about taking two and a half off for Christmas. So we can align it as close as possible to QPS just for uh, you know convenience sake. DCFS involved there are certain rules and paperwork and all sorts of stuff we have to take care of on our end but we'll double check and if I can grab your contact info from me before you leave tonight I'll follow up with you on that so glad that you brought that up excellent excellent question so we do not have special education her question was her son has an IEP how are we planning on accommodating that so we do not have a special education teacher on staff but we do have special education teachers as an advisory committee that is advising our staff and so when you go through the enrollment uh, process it will ask you on there does your child have an IEP or a 504 can we get a copy of it and do you give us permission to talk about that with our uh, special education committee? And that way, um, those teachers, along with our directors, can look through this and say, is this something we can accommodate or is it not? And the student is better suited being somewhere else for now. Now, <clears throat> our goal is to eventually hire a special education teacher and to uh, accommodate all uh, special needs. We just can't right now. But we want to be very honest with you guys about that. So if we get a copy of that IEP or 504 and we really don't feel like we are doing your, your student a service by coming to Almas and we can't meet their needs, we will be honest with you and tell you that. Yeah, because I was just a little concerned about, you know, where you guys are at on teaching versus where he's going to be at. Right. Well, with it being a mixed ability classrooms also, we are not... We, are, we don't have like a third grade set needs to be doing this, this, and this because they are in a mixed ability group. So we're gonna have varying degrees of um, those standards for each child. Mm -hmm. And a smaller classroom. Did everybody hear that, that response? No. Will you stand up and... <laughs> <laughs> um, so with special education also, one point was that we do have a smaller classroom size. So that way, that is a lot more one-on-one um, -on -one time with the teacher with the help of a teacher's aide. Plus, the special education board will help be helping us with those accommodations. What else did I say? Um, well, she was bringing up the mixed classroom. Oh, since so it's what a mixed classroom, there's not a, you won't have like a set, like he's nine years old, he should be hitting all these marks because since it's mixed ability within that classroom, we're gonna have all sorts of varying degrees um, of uh, ability in every single subject. Some are math oriented, some students are going to be language arts oriented, and then the age range in those uh, will vary. Well, because he, you know how you said you, you don't use computers in the classroom? That's the only way he knows how, he just can't write. Or... Right, and, we'll, and at special situations um, that they do use technology as an accommodation, those will be a special accommodation if that IEP calls for it. Right. Yes. Thank you. Have school nurse or somebody who can help in like We were not planning on having a school nurse. Uh, we were planning on handling um, any situations like that. Uh, either you, the, we call the parent. The parent comes in or tells us how they would like to handle if it's something minor, uh, or if it's something that requires a doctor. Obviously, we'll have your your uh, family doctor or pediatrician's information on hand and. We, we will have you sign off that we can call 911 in the case of an emergency. 
So uh, also a goal down the line is to have a school nurse. We just can't do it this year. school board so we don't have a lot of interest in the hybrid program in the rhetoric school right now um, if there is interest there we will go and talk directly with the counselors at QHS and their board to say we do have a couple of students that need accommodations here and then they will be coming over to us so that'll be a conversation that we'll have um, now my my girls uh, are enrolled at QHS to play soccer and the hybrid model for Ole Miss right now. They've, they've actually decided not to play soccer and to come to almost full time, but um, I didn't have any trouble at all with the counselor. We sat down and went through their, their schedule, signed them up for the classes, knowing that the rest was going to be taken care of here. So uh, once we have the interest where we really need to dive into that conversation, we will be more than happy to have it. We've already talked to Jody Steinke, the principal at QHS. So that will we'll further into that as need as, as we need to and make sure that we have if, if, if your particular student wants that then we have all those answers for you coming into it yes so it's not a TV question it's our first experience so if you go to the tuition does that include the lunch or whatever or so uh, food service Yep, so food service is also a challenge of ours this first year. It takes an extremely long time to get a food program up. So the first year will consist of you sending lunches for your student. Um, we will have, that's part of the, I should have mentioned that, that's part of the administrative volunteer committee too, is to have extra lunches there for a child. I mean, we all get busy, we all forget, you know, we're gonna, gonna make sure, we're gonna make sure no children are hungry. Um, so there will be extra, you know, peanut butter and jelly or, if you, Hopefully no peanut allergies. We'll make sure of that too. But you know what I'm saying? Just to make sure that there's something there. Now by next year, we want to have a food program up and running. Um, is that gonna increase the tuition cost, I assume? No, that will be just family, family based. If you still want to send uh, your child's lunch, you're more than welcome to do that, or you'll just pay into a separate school lunch fund. Sure. I was gonna I was gonna say too because um, I was also at Quincy Montessori School here in town and I always like to touch on the school lunch because they also do not have a school lunch at their program and I've seen it work to where families bring in the lunch it has never been an issue um, we, we provide snack and they bring in their sack lunch and uh, we've never had a complaint it has worked out fine and it has it, it allowed the school to save that money for teachers Everyone was in compliance of that. Yes. And so my son does the pre school program and the parents we were taking to bring in snacks mm -hmm. because the kids eat snacks and they eat snacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, is that something they would do here too? Is that parents provide the snacks in a rotation? Correct. Yep. We have we have already thrown that around. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? So the first year there is no transportation, but the second year maybe is. <laughs> transportation is <coughs> probably going to be our biggest challenge, really, because that's that's a bus, and that's where where are we picking up students? Do we have a big enough bus to go around and pick up everybody? Do we need more than one? I mean, there's just a lot of logistical questions there. I would say out of all of our challenges, that's probably the one that's going to take us the longest to meet. Okay. I wish you all the success, but if the plan A does not work, but you find a place to, for your school, what's the plan B? Plan B is to go back to, so if we don't get a building? Yeah. Okay, so the plan B is a pod system. So where uh, lower grammar is in this building, upper grammar is in this building, and, and we have already talked to area uh, charities, churches, where we can use spaces like that, uh, just on a just on a you know short term basis, 
Uh, now, one of the challenges that we have is because we are theologically neutral, when we go into these places, we have to, we, ha we, we don't just sign a physical contract with them, we also have to uh, go through ideology and say, we're going to be separate here too. So that has presented a challenge, but not in the places we've already talked to about the pod system. So that's our plan B. If we cannot get everybody in one building for this year, we are going to a pod system. And so every parent of that specific student for that program will know where their building is. So if I decide not to go to the, for example, QPS, so my school, my daughter cannot go to the school this year. So you, there's no way that there is no school budget dollars that no. can No, we are, we, we have 61, yeah, so we have 61 students currently. Um, uh, they've signed letters of intent to come. And we have a lot kind of waiting on the wings until we get some of these answers and make sure that they kind of know what's going on. This almost will be running in September. When are you gonna confirm last question? Sorry, but when are you gonna confirm it? So when they come on? Uh, <laughs> as soon as we finish these negotiations. So we're hoping very, very soon. We, we, are, we are hoping to know one way or the other by next week. So, but once again, I mean, if it's the week after, we're, we're trying, we will bring this information to you as soon as we have it. As soon as we've negotiated those contracts, you, you guys will all know. That's why we ask you for your contact info, so we can shoot you out an email and say, here's, here's what this looks like. Yes? Um, you know, it's um, such an unusual question, and I'm glad to know that it's moving forward, and I wish you all the best. You mentioned that financial aid is, is going to be covered by the tuition benefactors and fundraising, mm -hmm. of which fundraising is, is probably something that will start rolling soon. Do you have benefactors? We are talking with them right now. So that is rolling, yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yes? So that is also something that we are doing right now. Uh, we, we need five. We have three secured right now. Uh, and we are in the interview process with some very wonderful people. So we hope to have those answers all locked in by next week. And I've also interviewed a couple of uh, teachers' aides where the next step will be to introduce them to our teachers and let them really do that formal interview. So, anything else? How many classrooms? Yeah, just like one right so we have one classroom of lower grammar. We have one classroom of upper grammar. Um, we have one classroom of logic. We have one of everything right now. The only one that we're kind of bordering on is that logic. We're, we're starting to hit that number. So we'll see where it goes from there. All right, guys. I want to invite you, uh, Connie and Catherine, we're, are gonna, they have some curriculum out, so you're welcome to go look through it so you can see what this really looks like. If you have any questions, they will be over there to, to answer them. Um, that volunteer sheet that you're looking at, uh, please look that over and see if there's any, uh, any of those that interest you. We think you can really give your gifts and talents to Olmos. And um, did you bring the letters of intent as yes, well? Yes, so let's say letters of intent. If, you are, if you've not done a letter of intent, that that does not lock you in. It's nothing locking you in, but it's how we get your phone number, your email, your contact information. It gives us the grade, the ages, so that we can decide, oh, oh, we need two classes, we need two teacher's aides. So if you've not done a letter of intent, just fill one out. Um, that's also, we'll communicate on the Facebook page and on the Almost Academy website, but we'll also be sending you emails for updates so that you don't miss anything. So just make sure we have all of your contact information before you leave. And I'm available for questions, so if you guys have any questions you want to ask me, uh, I'll be here and no problem. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.